Welcome back. Today we'll be in chapter 9 um, and we'll be analyzing the great text Oedipus the King. Um, you probably know Oedipus by now. Um, I'll be using pictures today from the 1986 version uh, which is pretty available online done by Darth Vader there. <laughs> Not the voice of Darth Vader obviously but the, the physical actor who, um, who did the part. Now we call these the Theban plays. There are three of them, um, but they are not written originally as a trilogy. They are just the three surviving plays that we have um, from Sophocles. So, Oedipus the King. I, I debated with myself about whether or not uh, to make it required reading or not. I was kind of hoping that all the references in the script would be something that you. Um, already sort of had a basic understanding of Oedipus, maybe through a lit class or um, just through cultural references really. Um, but then when we really started digging into all of these ideas, um, it's, it's, the Greek is so foundational to our Western idea of play reading that it really was worth taking the time to sit down and take a, take a closer look at Oedipus the King. Um, Perhaps the main reason why Oedipus the King remains in infamy uh, is besides it being memorable, right? The plot line um, being the original mother ever, right? <laughs> to be crass. Um, it's a very memorable sort of character to pick on. And it's part of the reason it stays in the cultural um, milieu. But also Aristotle his famous lectures, the poetics, he used Oedipus the King as sort of this perfect play that he uh, had examples from about how great um, how great the play was. I think of the other reason why it survives uh, the test of time, why it's still produced and still lectured on and still relevant is that basic question of why do bad things happen to good people? right? We meet Oedipus and he, you know, his first sort of words are my children. He's a, he's king to his land. He's a nurturing king. He's a good man. He takes good care of his children. He's good to his wife. Um, he, by most terms, was a hero that we could admire. So when this horrible thing happens to him, we had these deep questions about where are the gods? Where is the higher power? Um, you know, when we look originally at the Odyssey and some of these other Grecian stories early on in Grecian culture, the gods are just... Um, you know, not as liable. And these are, this is when we really kind of get into the wrestling with fortune. You know, what is luck and what is fate? Is Oedipus, was he fated to do this? Did he have to do this? Did the, are the gods doing it for his amusement? Which I think, if we're honest, we've all felt that at some times. This is, this is some sort of cosmic joke. Am I um, suffering for no reason? Just really heavy and deep and meaningful questions. I think it also touches on a taboo. You know, we don't have um, many stories, plays out there about incest because it is still such a taboo, right? So for it to be sensational shock value, I think that's another reason why it abides. Um, and, and like I said, it, it, you know, when we look at the Grecian culture and how it evolved over time and how influential it was on these great minds, you know, I, I start my semester in public speaking talking about Aristotle on rhetoric and his ideas of good argumentation. You know, a lot of us start our semester with these Grecian minds who are sort of the foundation of our subject matter. Um, and so when we dig into Oedipus the King, we get a, a little hint into that psyche. And for those of us who um, read the Bible, we see a lot of crossover here. You know, the, the writers of the Bible were writing during this Hellenistic time, during a Roman, shortly after the Greeks, even the same languages. You know, that idea of hubris or, or tragic flaw that we see in analyzing the Greek plays is the same word that in the Bible we would use for sin right? We have that same sort of consequential uh, Hellenistic worldview where if something bad happens, we have to suffer the sins. We've got to get to the bottom of it. Truth will find its way out. So there's a lot of um, 
great minds thinking there in a way that is influential still on the organizational systems, on the um, institutions that we have in our mar modern kind of economy. If we look at a play like Hamlet, right, um, when um, the <laughs> the uh, great Olivier, Laurence Olivier, who is a British actor, played Hamlet, and I talked about that in the first chapter, there was a very sort of sensational moments in the play. Uh, first time he's alone with Olivier is alone with his mother in that version, you know, he full on kisses her on the mouth. In the scene where he stabs Polonius, um, they're wrestling on a bed. I mean, it is very incestuous. And part of that was Olivier's study of Oedipus and seeing what are these Oedipal desires and how could that maybe feed into this concept of Hamlet right and so it, it continues to influence staging it can if it uh, continues to influence um, a lot of of modern things that are still living and going and so that's part of the reason I decided to go ahead and cover it in this it is confusing part of the reason I, I inched away from it is because it is um, it is a long play. It is full of mythology that if you didn't know coming into, it can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, we have two basic towns here. We have Thebes and Corinth, right? We know um, if you've watched Hercules, Hercules, right? Zero to hero, <laughs> the Disney version, you know that Thebes is the place where bad things happen. And so when when we have that sort of uh, association with it, if we know anything about Grecian culture, we know that Thebes is, is where you go to fight the monsters because it's where bad things happen. Um, over in Corinth, where Oedipus thinks he was born, um, we have his parents and they're, you know, their paths cross. It's very close to each other um, there in Greece. So um, our central character is, of course, the namesake of the play, Oedipus the King. Um, not to be confused with uh, a later play, um, Oedipus at Colonus. Um, that's a different play. And then, of course, the middle play in the trilogy is Antigone, which is the story of his child of incest um, who wants to bury her brothers and um, thinks that they deserve a good burial, and Creon does not. So Creon is Oedipus's, um, he thinks at the beginning of the play, his brother-in-law, right? Um, and so Jocasta is, of course, his mom slash wife <sighs> and Laius is his father who he kills Tiresias we have in that floating bubble out there he is our blind prophet who um, is sort of this wonderfully honest character who comes in and tells the truth we have also have several messengers and uh, chorus members who are not listed here but um, try not to get overwhelmed by the mythology of all of it and the confusing Greek names. Um, we're just looking at the basic storylines here. So for our textbook, we're talking about things that are less tangible. We're talking about emotional things today. I have a picture here of an over-the-top Oedipus from the turn of the century. Uh, there was this period of time called voice beautiful when people were really playing their words and playing the mood and wallowing in the emotion of things and of course this was a, a reaction against imperialism that came with the kind of swashbuckling 1900s um, and so we go into this conversation about mood tentatively because we know that emotion is something delicate it's something that we can't overplay or um, or indulge in too much or our audience uh, will tune out right it's something to be tread lightly um, but beyond just emotion Aristotle in his great work we just talked about the um, the poetics talked about one of these elements just being everything you hear everything you hear in a play is important right from the actor's intonation, the actor's timing, all of that makes up part of what we hear. At sound effects, um, you know, instruments, percussive instruments, if we look at the Asian arts, all of them have 
a drum section. <laughs> you never go to a Japanese play, an Asian play of any kind, without a drum section um, because they're more overt in the use of chorus and, and percussion in the use of chorus. And I don't know about you, but I find this very true for myself that I have emotional responses to rhythmic cadences, right? Um, when I go to hear live music, when I go to see a Broadway play, I um, have overt emotional response to it. And the same can be true of poetry right just the rhythms that we feel just um, I think it's not a coincidence for us that poetry has a certain rhythmic quality to it right I have a little four-year-old and still every now and then I get to rock him to sleep now the science behind that they say that when the baby is close enough to the mother's heartbeat they can hear it and that um, calms them Right, so when he crawls his little scrawny body in my lap, puts his head on my heart, and I can rock him in a rocking chair, that has an emotional experience, a relaxation, it mirrors what he felt in the womb, and it's a way for me to fight the, the frustration of the day, um, even as a four-year-old, right? Um, sing a little song, we, we rock, and that has an emotional experience. Right, and we would be amiss in theater if we just looked at the technical and didn't look at the musical magic, the emotional undertones of a script. <laughs> Steve Martin. Ah, Steve Martin to me is just a quintessential comic who has the best comedic timing. Uh, and and it's, um, it's, I don't know if it's something that can be taught. I'm not sure. Um, I, I'd like to think that it is. I like to think that when I'm directing students, I can encourage them to cut out those pregnant pauses or pay more attention to certain moments and their timing. Um, but there's something sort of ephemeral about the idea of timing, right? Um, uh, percussionists have a special skill, a musical skill. Um, musicians, my mom was a piano teacher, as I mentioned last class, and some people have rhythm and some people just don't, right? Um, and uh, when we hear this in rehearsals, sometimes it can be something simple like pick up your cue, that meaning, um, you know, when that last line is over, it's your turn to pick up your cue and say your next line. But it also could be something about slowing down, right this moment is dense and we'll talk about that in just a minute times when we need to slow down the rhythms so when we talk about speed we're talking about the rate of speech right the rate of speech or movement and some we all know this is something intuitive but it's something to think about as a, a director or designer some people just move slower we in the South notoriously move a little bit slower than people up North, right? People as they age, most people slow down a bit, right? Uh, most people don't have that same rate. So if you're playing someone younger, if you're playing someone older, um, and you need to think about that in your casting, if you're a director, uh, what sort of energy does is the character written in? And then does that person's natural energy suit that? Or are they an actor with enough range to sort of match that speed, whether it be slowing down or speeding up, right? Tiresias we have here is this kind of wonderfully crusty old man. He's blind and um, he is speaking a lot of truth and um, he's angry and a lot of us when we get angry we want to speed up um, but he has to um, to sell the age of it really needs to stay a little bit more slow um, and he probably as a blind man moves slowly right so when we look at measuring movement of speech and and speed we have to kind of go at it with some nuance and say um, so we can't just say the whole thing needs to be super fast because this is a period play and people don't want to sit here for three hours or whatever the case may be right we we can't just go at it with same thing I've been saying over and over again I feel like the the anthem of this class is 
avoid uniformity, right? There has to be texture. There has to be variations in pace. Um, and that will happen because you have different actors and they'll bring a different energy to their part, a different speed to their part. I am usually of the Gilmore Girls variety. I talk a mile a minute. And if I'm not careful, I can run right over my audiences if I'm not intentional about slowing down, right? <laughs> So what I was just saying about pace, um, pace is your audience or your director's perception, right? And it differs for different people. Not to be ugly, but people who are quick on the uptake um, tend to think a little faster, right? If you're doing a play for children, you don't want to speed through it because they their little baby brains are still processing. Uh, they need time to kind of put it together and hopefully a good author who's writing plays for young audiences is going to know that and, and unroll the plot in a way that's a little more overt and maybe a little bit slower, right? But it is worth saying that if your actors don't have their lines memorized, we're going to have long pauses between ideas. If you have someone working on a light board who doesn't realize it's their turn to change the cue, are going to slow things down and audiences especially modern audiences are going to be very impatient with that right you can have the best written play in the world but if it's executed poorly then it's going to affect the pace and uh, good directors worry about the pace of a play because they want to protect their audience experience right so there's this horrible old adage about a director just saying louder faster funnier uh, which is you know if you're doing a comedy there is that temptation to just want to speed things up and um, you know with enough practice becomes it becomes faster um, but this is this is not something we actually need it, don't don't take that advice that it just needs to be louder faster and funnier uh, that's a lazy director's refrain there should be nuance there should be um, moments of great tragedy back to back with a comedy because the comedy usually isn't funny unless it's grounded in pain so it is worth mentioning that these distinctions that are um, analyst James Thomas is making are not necessarily what you're going to see reflected in everyday world you know when you say tempo um, in a theater you may or may not people might have different connotations I think he's smart to sort of make these delineations of all of these ways that rhythm pace and tempo are important um, but they're the words are used interchangeably so just a little hedging our bets there um, that if you're talking to any theater artist, don't just assume that they have the same definition of the difference between um, uh, tempo and rhythm and pace that you do. So for the purposes of this class, by tempo he means how often are these audience's members being fed new information, right? And that information can come either through plot, character, or idea. Right. So obviously a show like 24 was made famous because there was so many, so much action happening in a 24 hour period. Right. There's a very eventful 24 hours. And that's why the play was, you know, uh, not the play, the sitcom, you know, 24 um, was able to get and maintain its audiences. If you're dealing with action as a genre, you're going to have a lot of plot changes. Whereas when we're looking at a a show like Oedipus, it's a thinking man's play, right? It's really about the idea and about the character. And um, it is it is about the plot too. Plot's number one in Aristotle's ideas of what's important. But um, we see uh, lots of great uh, pull quotes from Oedipus. One of my favorite lines comes from the chorus. Um, Wisdom changes hands among the wise. I think that's just a great adage. Um, to, to talk about, you know, you may think that you're the wisest person on earth, um, but that doesn't mean once you kind of you own wisdom, you know. We see here Oedipus um, solving the riddle with a sphinx, and that's a original art that came off of a pot of the depiction of Oedipus. Um, remember, Oedipus was a myth. It was not just a Sophocles didn't invent the story. That would be saying like Disney invented the story of Snow White. Well, he didn't. You know, Disney just told a story we've been telling for hundreds of years. So um, this is a thinking man's play and the ideas are very important. But we see plot, character, and idea all kind of being un uncurled in their time right, the frequency of that information. 
Now, if you're doing a witty farce, um, it can be thinner content-wise, and the the play can roll trippingly off the tongue. We can move real fast through the play if it's a light-hearted comedy, right? Something uh, like a Ken Ludwig or a, a Noel Coward. These are written to be fast-paced plays with um, not a lot of dense. If we had a show like Hamlet or Oedipus and we were just flying through the content, we're going to see complaints. It's interesting, um, as I'm recording this, Game of Thrones is wrapping up and I have to admit I'm not a huge fan, but I'm seeing all of these people sort of speculate about the ending of Game of Thrones and they're using this kind of language um, that we as analysts use um, and they're, you know, they don't have the terminology, they don't have the vocabulary to say it, but um, what I'm seeing from a lot of, you know, my friends and students is, okay, in this last season of Game of Thrones, they're just trying to wrap it up, so they're just throwing all these plot points out without a lot of um, reach back, by which we mean like not a lot of reference to storylines or the mythology that the world has created. Um, I mean, these are really sophisticated critiques because the writing is is pretty good on Game of Thrones. Like I said, I just can't watch it because of the violence. I'm such a wimp when it comes to that kind of stuff. Even watching Oedipus again um, and seeing the blood streaming down his face, I'm like, oh, this is so gross. Um, but when we have um, good writing, the tempo is um, well interspersed. It's not clumsy and all in the last season that we're kind of wrapping up all these loose ends, right? So when, when we're approaching the pace of a play, we need to think about um, the unfurling of information and not rush over moments that have gravitas, right? We don't want to rush moments that have gravitas. So we can see this sort of um, character disclosure through Creon. Remember, Creon is Jocasta's brother, and he um, is when Oedipus does exile himself. We see that he is the um, the king elect, right? He's one of the kings. He's a prince, really. Um, and he, he kind of likes his position because he gets to have authority without having to make hard decisions that make enemies. It's kind of a funny little section of the play when he's talking about that. But he, he comes in, he storms in and says, I've been accused of these things by Oedipus. I've been accused of setting Tiresias up to sort of put me on the throne. And he comes in, um, I am told that heavy accusations have been brought against me by King Oedipus. I am not the kind of man to bear this tamely. If in these present difficulties he holds me accountable for any harm to him through anything I have said or done. Why then, I do not value life in this dishonor. It is not as though this rumor touched upon some private indiscretion. The matter is grave. The fact is that I am being called disloyal to the state, my fellow citizens, to my friends. Right? And so we see um, that we get to see his values, what Creon um, plainly laden out, which for a modern actor is like, what? The playwright just hands me what what I value? That's usually kind of the text work that we have to do to mine a little bit deeper. Um, but remember in Oedipus's day, when, and in the day of Sophocles, in the time of um, Aristotle, when you went before a court, when you went in a throne room situation like this, you had to state your credibility. And, um, you know, if you're a poor kid like me, part of what you buck against is that your credibility is your bloodline. Um, but, you know, he comes in and says, am I not this prince? Do I not have discretion? Do I not um, always serve the state? And he just comes out and says his values, right? Now, to a modern ear, once again, we're like, why is he talking so much about what he likes? We don't really care. Um, but do you understand it in context? Then we understand its pertinence to the situation, his credibility, Right. Very rarely do we in modern conversation walk up to someone and say, oh, yes, I am a trustworthy person right? because, um, you know, we expect people to prove their virtue by their actions. So we see that he's a very reasonable person in the way that he argues and um, but that he also has a impatient sensibility to him. And we already see that Oedipus is a hothead, too. We can imagine part of that just comes from being part of the aristocracy. 
right? And so when they start yelling at each other, when they um, clip one after another one, you know, we see them kind of quipping at each other um, quickly, sort of um, insulting or losing or threatening, and we get into this really heated debate, and we um, get to look at kind of a deeper picture of what their personalities are. So remember, if you know that the personality of the character you're playing is impatient, then that needs to go into the way that you deliver the lines, right? What sort of emotion is evoked in an impatient person? Um, and usually a sense of petulance, right? Um, whether that petulance comes out and whining or throwing things or explosive anger, uh, you know, we see that. Right. We also see from the dialogue that Creon is educated, and Oedipus even mocks Creon's flamboyance in his language. And, um, you know, Creon speaks very eloquently, and Oedipus, although he is a prince um, himself, doesn't seem to have the same sort of elocution and educated speak style. So, when we look beat for beat at this um, conflict, at their values, at their relationship significance, um, we start to see where the pertinent information is. As an actor or a director, you want to highlight those lines that help tell the story, help clarify the relationship, help progress the plot, right? And especially if you, as the director, are also going to be maybe an editor. You know, if you're dealing with a greenlit play and you're ready to sort of cut lines, you really need to make sure that you know the significance of what the character's saying and don't lose some point of the plot, right, um, for the sake of tempo, because that, um, that can pe leave people walking away feeling unsatisfied. Right, so Oedipus the King is a classic play, and it's going to use words to describe you know Creon comes in and he says what kind of man he is um, but you know adaptations um, clever directing styles can use illustrative action instead uh, one of the best examples I saw of this was um, a version of Othello done at Nashville Shakespeare um, Theater in um, I say it's Nashville Shakespeare Festival, but it was their winter play of Othello starring Eddie George, and um, they had this sword fighting scene. And of course I had been in Othello before, but I had never um, seen it staged this way. I don't know if that director was the origin originator of the idea, but Iago and Othello are talking about the possibility of Desdemona being unfaithful. And then through their practicing of the sword fighting, we really get to f hear the pace of it with the clanging of the swords. We got to have this momentum built up and it was really illustrative. Now, that's a that was a really well done scene. But then we see other moments where just giving someone physical action, right? Um, notoriously in NYPD we see um, in these detective shows like Criminal Minds, you know, somebody's unloading a box and it's like just stage directions that don't seem to have purpose. But as an actor, you can use that physical action to show, for example, petulance in the case of Creon, right? Um, Probably one of the other tropes that we see a lot is women hanging laundry or working on laundry, um, you know, in, in um, our town, the women snapping beans, right? How does that bean snapping between Emily's mother and Emily, that moment on the porch with your maternal figure, you know, how does that unpack and how, how does the use of that snapping beans uh, communicate to Emily what Emily's mother is trying to say? So. Um, using that physical action can help elucidate the intentions of what's really going on underneath the characters. So, what's yet another distinction here is rhythm. Rhythm, and they're calling that uh, the change of tension, right? Um, the changing tension, and that can come um, from beat to beat, but it can also happen when you know one person is on stage. We might have a certain kind of energy or mood, and then a different character comes on stage, and we have a different um, energy or mood. And we see the changing between the larger strokes of the play, right? I've got rhythm. I've got music. <laughs> 
Um, this is always sort of an actor challenge, a director challenge, when we get into staging these ancient plays, because the chorus um, is traditionally comes from this agricultural ritual of stomping and they would in the Dithia Rab they would be marching in a circle and pounding the um, wheat and stepping on the wheat and separating it the threshing floor um, and that was where the original theater was right they would sing these ritualistic songs to Dionysus asking them to bless um, their harvest asking them for a, a large harvest and um, that original ritual in that circular dithyarab pattern is what started to draw a crowd. And then we have Thespis, our first actor, stepping out of the chorus, and he um, he is kind of this foundation of the chorus, still singing and chanting and stomping, which is a very um, primal sort of experience, very rowdy, and. Um, Still, when we look at the staging of Oedipus, there are only three sort of standout characters who get rotated among Jocasta, Messenger, but you're never, the chorus is almost always on stage, but these other characters sort of rotate out in, at that time in different masks. So we see this huge shift between a naturalistic conversation for example between Creon and Oedipus where they're just talking and having this fight about you did it no I didn't yes you did no you didn't right the same sort of thing we could see we could stage that as a scene study you know in a modern environment without much uh, without much alienation from the audience but when we get into these choral experiences they're written highly stylized often even in translation there's a poetry to it there's a rhythm often that's distinctive often the um, the chorus is arbitrarily divided whether it be um, between the um, I was trying to look at the the version that I have here in front of me which is the David Green translation I believe he just puts them in the strophe and the antistrophe um, but a, a creative director with a chorus can do three people talking at once four people talking at once and then one person gets really the chorus is very open to interpretation in the way that you describe it but there's always a dramatic shift in the rhythm right because we go from it being more naturalistic to it being more stylized so we have these huge sort of shifts between when um, for example here at the setup of the play the priest comes in and says rise children it is the time we came to seek and they all leave right talking about the oracle and the plague and then we go into this really stylized questions of God and Thebes and healing and Artemis and Zeus and it's through this larger picture of, of almost if if we were staging it for film zooming way out and looking at the whole picture and the relationship between the universe and and deities and huge shifts in rhythm that we wouldn't see in a modern play if we're not careful and we're staging a play uh, like Piano Lesson, there may be similar rhythms the whole time. Now, August Wilson has written in different poetic um, styles. For example, Doker's going to be a little slower, and he speaks in long paragraphs explaining the history of their ancestors, uh, where Willie, Boy Willie, is you know much more impetuous. Uh, petulant and impatient and interrupting and loud, and so but we see these differences between the scenes and these dramatic shifts when the chorus starts speaking from how it was. So the last of the three things we're looking at in this chapter is mood. Um, mood is probably the greatest misunderstanding in theater and um, the the biggest difference we'll see between what a literary person thinks and what a um, theatrical person thinks right um, mood is just kind of the emotional overtones right and when we talk about mood we mean just persistently throughout the whole play the atmosphere the mood um, of course Oedipus is a you know tragedy we've got this mood of overarching gloom and pain and um, desperation right um, and that's uh, some theater artists would call that the atmosphere 
And, um, you know, this can be done through musical undertone, of course, is a huge element in mood. Um, if you've ever, you know, tried to watch a film, a great film, and then listen to it with different music or with, um, even on mute, it loses so much of the, the tension and the um, emotion just through losing that atmospheric music that makes all the difference. And, um, you know, mood is often easier to point out when you're doing a musical or a play with music. I would argue that Oedipus is a play with music um, because mood can be easily transferred through music or through undertones, musical underscores. But we have to warn here. Uta Hagen says, mood, spelled backward, is doom. And I have a picture here of Jocasta um, because I think that this actress does a great job of not um, leaning in to the mood as much. I've seen, you know, um, there's a particular version of Antigone that I just can't watch uh, because she's so wrenching the air and beating her breast and breathing uh, so in a way that I would consider, you know, um, much of a hypochondriac kind of almost. Um, my four-year-old could do that kind of performance. Uh, we have to be careful with mood. It's something we need to be aware of. And if, and we as emotionally intelligent people, often we're in this field because we have a certain level of emotional intelligence intelligence, we can intuit the moods um, based on the language, but we have to give it the dignity of that being a real situation. We can't overplay the mood, um, or as Uta Hagen would say, um, you know, mood spelled backwards is doom. So we have to play the objectives, we have to play the language, we can't play a mood before the event happens, right? I think that this actress does a great job as Jocasta of coming in and saying, you know, here's the man I love. Uh, you know, we don't get these from the very first moment she's on stage. We don't have this sort of wounded deer look that, you know, I have seen portrayed for Jocasta. So just a little friendly reminder, emotional experiences are delicate, they're intricate, they vary from night to night, right? Um, the, the musical underscore may not, but an actor interpreting the emotions, one night you may have tears, the next night you may not. And so don't, um, don't let atmosphere be something that becomes stagnant. Um, some nights there will be more provocation, more uh, freshness, more awareness, um, and the mood is really something that the playwright has baked into the play, not something you need to be aware of, but something that if you spend too much of your emphasis focusing on the mood of something, um, you can kill the active side of it, right? So be very careful in dealing with mood. Um, it's often just something that you as a emotionally intelligent person can intuit in the moment and not necessarily something that you have to sit down. Now, I say that if you're overthinking, for example, a design and you you go back and reread the play and say, wait a minute, this isn't really the mood of the play. And just as we talked about early on, you know, if you're costuming a comedy and you put them in a silly hat, if you're costuming, um, you know, there's not a, I would argue that the messenger is a little bit of a comic relief character, but I don't see many silly hats in Oedipus. But when you have these sort of far out concepts or high minded concepts, sometimes we can, um, overdo it if we're not careful. So remember the mood of the play, but don't dwell at it. Don't sit in it. Or otherwise you lose that action. You lose the intention, which is really the core. I, I kind of tagged on something that um, is, is food for thought for us as future theater makers. Doesn't really have anything to do with the tempo, rhythm, or mood other than um, it's really more about Oedipus particularly. So when we look at these ancient classical plays, whether Greek or Roman, they very rarely show blood and guts. One of my favorite moments in the script is when the messenger comes back in and is describing the blood and the guts and saying, um, 
you know, exactly how Oedipus gouged out his own eyes, right, um, in, in gross detail. And, and Oedipus isn't um, the only play where we see this, right? Agamemnon does this. Um, we, we have this in almost all of the Greek plays. Never do we see violence on stage. And honestly, I kind of enjoy that better. Um, the anticipation, the description, I can paint it with my mind. Um, you know, I don't watch a lot of scary movies or horror movies, but it's just not my favorite genre. But when I get into signs and that moment when we finally see the alien, uh, you know, and I'm like, oh, well, that's kind of disappointing. I, the, this whole time you get to hear the alien, you're imagining the alien, but then when you finally see it, it's kind of a letdown. Right. Um, I think we get that moment a little bit when Oedipus comes out with his eyes gouged out. Um, but a, a concept for Oedipus is is sort of critical. That moment when he comes out with his guide, owls, eyes gouged out. Um, this is the National Theater in the bottom uh, right hand corner, and I've included a clip for you to watch. Hopefully, as I continue to reteach this class, the clip will still be available. But um, they obviously have a more stylized version. Julie Taymor, when she directed the opera of Oedipus the King, um, you know, she had a more stylized large mask above his head. Um, but uh, being that messenger, describing that violence um, with such poetry and painting the picture for us, the other question that I just ask myself as a, as a person who makes art is what does it do to us to see this violence? Um, when we see it depicted, when we see graphic images, is it necessary to the story sometimes to see? I would argue if you're doing Evil Dead the musical, you better have some blood and guts on stage. People pay to see that stuff, right? But when we're doing these classical pays, plays, to what extent do we need to see the blood? I don't know. Disney's gotten in a lot of trouble by not showing blood. Um, you know, people try to throw that and hurl it as an insult. Um, but the the mood of the play... Uh, is the overarching tempo and rhythm and mood and emotional undercurrent of the play is something we have to make sure we keep our finger on it. Uh, misinterpretation can happen when we start overthinking or getting out of our bodies, but as you read a play for the first time, take special notice to write down the way that the play is making you feel. Spe take special notice to see, uh, do you have any visceral reactions to having someone's eyes being gouged out, being described to you. That undercurrent, that emotional intensity is something we want to maintain for our audience members, um, something that we don't just lose uh, with our familiarity in the play, especially if we have a process that goes over six months, over a year. Um, we can become almost desensitized to the beauty or the uh, gravitas of a play. And so today we've been talking about tempo, rhythm, and mood. Sometimes the textbook definitions are a little bit arbitrary in their distinctions, um, but it just speaks to the importance overall of timing and emotion when we're dealing with these play powerful plays. Um, as always, thank you for listening.